Hey everybody, St. Paul here, and welcome to another episode, number 32, of Music on the Run. This week, one of my favorite drummers on the planet, from Minneapolis, Mr. Michael Bland, is next on Music on the Run. Hey everybody, St. Paul Peterson here. Welcome to episode 32 of Music on the Run. Uh, my next guest is best known probably for his work as a drummer with Prince and Soul Asylum. He's also a producer, uh, a writer, and a loud voice for social and political issues. He's a Minneapolis native and he's been my friend for many, many years. Please welcome my guest, Michael Bland. Michael B. Hey, man. Man, is it good to see you. I haven't it's, seen you, I mean, in way too long. Yeah, I mean, even before the pandemic, I think it had been a year already. Or Jeez, something like that. that. Really? We cut that one track. Oliver's Session. That was the last time I saw you, I think. Right. Right, because yeah, uh, you and I cut something in the water together, which was on my, it was a single I put out about a year ago, but sure. we cut that way before that. Yeah. yeah too long. Too long, whatever it be, it'd be too long. Yeah, so uh, where have you been during this entire crazy pandemic, non-playing year? Wow. Uh, mostly at home. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, Soul Asylum did a couple of streaming events, one in October, okay. and then we did our holiday show from First Avenue uh, in late December. So that's okay. the last time that we really you know, got together officially to do anything. Uh, but um, Dave's working on new music now, and so I'm just kind of waiting until things are developed to the point where, you know, I can make a contribution. Sure. Uh, but other That's than how that, that works, huh? He, he comes up with the concepts, and then he's like, okay, fellas. Yeah. Turn. That's pretty much it. I mean, he, um, he well, you know, I mean, Ryan Smith and Jeremy Tapero, the bass player and the guitar player, mm -hmm. they, they've been going to his house, like, you know, weekly, like sometimes Monday, sometimes Wednesday, sometimes both, and just kind of helping him push things along. But I mean, it's like, first off, his studio is like, it's like a little bomb shelter. <laughs> it's like, they're already, you know, uh, you know, Elbows in everybody's rib cage, like they don't need me down there. Just I you hear you. everybody, it's right. <laughs> God, why don't why? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gangway. So they, <laughs> yeah, come on, throw. Hot yeah, exactly. Hey. They don't need me down there. Just you know. <laughs> yeah. Got so it. you know, they just they 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 work. They record things, you know, and they document everything. But then the next phase is to take it down to the rehearsal space where we're we're set up to multi track. Oh, and right. Yeah, so I got my drums are set up down there. I mean, I I could be doing more online stuff, I suppose, but yeah, nobody, you know, the, the, nobody usually asks me, so I don't. Well, I'm going to start asking because I didn't <laughs> know you were set up. Because not see now you opened up a can of worms. There's a way for me to do it, I, and I and I'd Beautiful. be uh, perfectly willing. All you have Great. to do is call. Good to hear that. After, after the cold snap. After the cold oh. snap, you got me. <laughs> so I'm trying to sneak out of here in a week, and I yeah. am just hunkering down, and I woke up today with a little sniffle in my throat, and I'm like, oh, it goes oh, to no. panic, and you go, you have COVID. Exactly. Don't. You don't, uh, I haven't been around anyone. Yeah, just one sneeze, and, and you're, oh, I'm a goner. <laughs> yeah, well, don't you don't sneeze in public either, by the way. Oh, because then you really will be a goner. They'll beat you down. They will beat you <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I got to give a little backstory on your and my relationship to the people who are listening or watching. I well, one story in particular is that uh, this is many years ago, and my kids were tiny, and I would take them in the car to go to daycare, which just happened to go <laughs> right by your house. You know, about six thirty, seven in the morning, and of course, I've been caffeinated for an hour already, so I'd be, be on the horn by Michael South. Beep, 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 beep. And of course, I'd go, Michael, did you hear that? Next time I saw him, and you'd say, 
<laughs> yeah, I heard it. My 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 ex wife, she she wait, she you know sit up in the bed and just just give me the evil eye. Yeah, that's Paul. Cool. That's got to be your friends. Oh yeah, yeah, and it'd be you or it'd be you and Rick. And just <laughs> oh yeah, we had the horn. We had we had a pallet for the horn. We could really yeah. One particular car, the the horn was super responsive, and it hasn't been the same since. I mean, the new cars don't have the same response on the horn, Whoa. so we can't irritate people as well as as, we, as musically as as uh, it's true. not as many uh, subdivisions and that's that's right. Time signatures and whatnot. You're right. Can't do it in twelve nine. No. So, so we've known each other a long time. Do you even remember when we met? I mean, you were a kid. I honestly don't. I don't. I remember meeting Ricky. Okay. I remember meeting Patty. Somehow you just kind of, we just kind of. Re- well, I, I remember meeting you. Uh, you were playing an outdoor gig with my sister Patty. I right, think it was one of the first gigs that I St. Anthony, Maine, or something like that. And my that memory's right. terrible. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. But you couldn't have been more than seventeen. I 18, think I, I was sixteen, like seventeen. Yeah, and John De La Selva, God bless him, was the one who like went to Patty and said, "Hey, this kid, I had just sat in with with Doctor Mambo's combo at some gig at the Caboose where they were just wow. playing like an hour, and Vandell had something else to do, and uh, and I think they just they were just hoping somebody would be able to cover the gig, and I think they saw me playing with somebody else, and and Tim Emerson was, oh hey." Uh, um, you know, would you uh, would you sit in with us? And, uh, okay, and I didn't. I'd never heard the band. I didn't know what was going on, and uh, and I remember <laughs> I did the gig and I did pretty good. Except uh, I didn't know you got the love by Rufus and Chaka Khan, Ooh. and and that guitar figure threw me off. Oh, sure, we should. So I'm playing on the opposite side, and Margaret's looking back, ice grilling me like, who is it? <laughs> Who's this kid? And and I guess she leaned over and she said, Timo, don't ever hire him again. No. <laughs> and uh, so I, my fate should have been sealed. 30 but years then, later, you're still in the band. Well, yeah. Vandell saw me at the Twin Cities Best Drummer Contest and was like, hey, and like brought me into the fold then. So by the time I actually went to Bunkers, Bobby was like, yeah, just come in. I'll, you know, I'll wave you in. I was like, I'm 16. He's like, yeah, it's okay. And I was hanging out there. I was hanging at uh, the Whiskey Junction when Doug Maynard was playing on Sundays. Sure. And, you know, Big Ray, Big Ray Parsons would do, just stand behind Ray. You'll, you'll be all right. Oh, right, right, right. And the fights would break out. And Ray hey, he would grab <laughs> two bikers and clunk them together like Mo, And, you know, out the front door. And I was 16 just. You you got a you got an eye full and an ear full too. Oh yeah! What great people to surround yourself with, though. I mean, we got to mention. I mean, you mentioned this guy Bobby Vandell, <laughs> or those of you who don't know who Bobby Vandell is, he is a Minneapolis icon drummer who started a band that's very famous here called the TC Jammers. Yes, and he championed. He said, and I saw him the other day. He said, much to my sometimes demise, he's championed drummers and, and things like that who have sometimes eased him out of a gig <laughs> on yeah. one occasion or another, but he doesn't care. He's That's the heart that he's got. And I didn't know that he had seen you and he was championing. Champion, he, champion he brought me right to the music. band and then I got hired. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and God bless Bobby because he never held it against me. He never said one unkind word. You know, I mean, he, he really is. He he really is the person that he represents himself to be. He is a he's a conduit. He's a he, he's what do they call that? Like a, a real a hookup. <laughs> a hookup. Yeah, that's a what hookup. you call it. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's funny is that um whenever I do that for someone else, they always ask me, What can I do for you? I'm like, you pay that forward. You just yeah. continue mm-hmm. to to nurture and, and pay that forward, you know? That's what sure. I think. Well, that's what happened uh, for me with, with uh Dave Anania. Dave Ananias started coming down, sitting in. So did Dorian Crozier when they, when those guys moved to right. town. And lo and behold, I mean, uh, I think Dorian quit Greasy Meal to move to L.A. And Fields called me. Hey, 
you want to <laughs> you want to quit playing on on the corner for for no money and join the greasy meal, <laughs> you know? And I said, wow. I I can't do that. These are my people. I mean, y'all are my people, but right. Doug, Billy and Stevie and those guys that that yeah, I'm home down there. We don't. I mean, we're taking a hit. You know, everybody they come over to Whiskey Junction on the break. And go back oh, wow. over to see Greasy. And we knew the gig was dying on the vine. And they were, they were doing us in, man. Yeah. And, you know, but what was that going to look like for me to just jump ship and just, you know, that, there was no way for that to be right. You so stuck it, You stuck it out, man. Yeah, I, I, I recommended Anania. And God. lo and behold, he got in there and, you know, started. That was a great period right of time in Minneapolis music, too. That band was fire with fields and yeah. issues and. They really brought it every week. They did. Yeah. Well, let, I'm going to take you back again because the Peterson family immediately fell in love with you personally, and and of course your your talent. And it was fun to see you play with Patty. And then Ricky must have saw you. Is he? Did Ricky introduce you to Hiram Bullock? Then is that? That's that exactly worked? what happened. They were cutting over at Metro, and Ricky walked in with Hiram, and we were playing. Uh, do go go do 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 I can't remember. I think it might have been "Give It What You Got." I think it was one of Hiram's songs. And sure, Charlie Drayton on drums. Or were you playing? No, Charlie was on. Was uh oh? I mean, I was playing with Patty at the Fine Line. Okay, got it. And yeah, Charlie was doing those sessions over there. Okay, and um, they came over and. Uh, Hiram was like, oh, oh, hey. And there was, and I think Della Silva was like, well, we play one of your songs. So we ended up playing that. And uh, Hiram just kind of kept looking back like, hey, well, this kid. Okay, kid. And that led, I think, Charlie was on his way to go play with Herbie and the, and the Headhunters. The Headhunters had gotten back together. Oh. And Charlie was going to play. So uh, they had a gig booked at the fine line. And Hiram... Asked me to do it, and um, that was really? uh, yeah. Ricky, was, you Hiram Will, uh, 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 Steve, George, uh, Steve, yeah, Bailey, I think was his name. Steve Bailey, I think that, his name was Steve. Va Steve, Steve Va Logan, Steve, Steve Logan. Logan, that's it. Yeah, that's right. who it was. Incredible. Yeah, I heard, I heard he passed. He's gone now, yeah. unfortunately, but yeah, he, yeah, great player, man. Wow, so there, there's your jump start right there. That was it, and that led to a gig at McKell's on 97th and Columbus in New York, and uh, like a, a, a festival, like a jazz festival in, where's Eric from? It was his town. Where's er Eric's from? Uh, Eric, Eric Reed is, they're from Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Yeah, Pittsburgh, yeah. Yep, that's where it was. I thought you were talking about a different country. I'm like, he's from no. a, pla a different planet, but <laughs> Pittsburgh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Pittsburgh. But, uh, yeah, it, it was a Pittsburgh, like a G Three Rivers Festival, I think it was called. Got it. And it was like Randy Brecker played, a bunch of bunch of Ooh. cats played. And Hiram, let me let me take a solo that night, and it was really like, I just, like, it was, it was a whole, I mean, Ricky was the one sitting next to me on my first plane flight. I'm sure he told you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a like, lot of years since he shared that story, but you got to so, well tell these. Well, guys. yeah, I mean, I'd never been on a plane before, let alone been to New York. That was my right. first time going. I was 17, and Ricky and I were sitting next to each other. And, and you know, we got that, got, got the seatbelts on, and we started flying, and he could tell I was nervous. I, every time <laughs> something happened, I was, what's that? What? what? And, and um, we were in flight, and <laughs> some of that happened. Right, right. Uh, what, what, what was that? <laughs> Ricky's like, relax, man. It's just turbulence. It, it happens. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Be cool, man. It's it's all right. You know, and I, just God bless him. God bless him. So just Ricky. to remind folks, he's talking about my brother, Ricky Peterson. But That's right, Ricky Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, so he was just... Ricky was, uh, I mean, your entire family has been a godsend to me. You know that. I, well, me, me and JP. I, I told you we adopted you from yeah. the minute we saw you because we loved you and we loved your, your, your playing and your approach to everything, man. I mean, that's just how we roll. Yeah, so. ex exactly. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in college at Augsburg and me and JP, I'm like, you look like, are, are you related to the Petersons? About. Yeah. And yeah. And so me and JP, you know, we were both in jazz band one. And we'd get there early and be playing all, you know, just all out and abstract. Right, of and course. Just, yeah. Yep. So 
Uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't long before he cycled himself out of that because he just right. he had more options before I did. You know, so when did your option with so you did the gig with Hiram Bullock? Uh-huh. When did that turn into the Prince gig? Is that the order of things? That is pretty much the order of things. I mean, I I was uh, uh, at some point Bobby went away to like Los Angeles. And Bobby Vandell. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. So I got to use first and last names. I'm, well, we're too familiar. These guys don't know who we're talking about otherwise. Bobby Vandell. And he was like, hey, I need you to cover my gigs with Doug Maynard and then with Lamont on the weekends. So at that time, the combo took over Monday and Tuesday at okay. Bunkers. And then I play Wednesdays there with Doug Maynard. Thursdays were off. And then Friday and Saturday with Lamont, with Lamont, the Lamont, Lamont Cranston band with right. Pat Hayes. Right. And then Sundays with the men who eat out at the Whiskey Junction. <laughs> I was working six days a week, and Doug Nelson was on every gig. <laughs> Great and, bass player from Minneapolis here, Doug Nelson. Yeah, Doug Nelson was, I mean, so, you know, he was another one who just showed me the ropes and just, you know, like, no, you don't do it like that. Yeah, well, there's what that relationship do. between a bass player and a drummer that is undeniable. And Absolutely, what a great guy to to show you the ropes, too. What a what a, what a talent! All those dudes were sweethearts. Yeah. De, De, De La Selva, Billy yep. Fonzie, Doug, Steve Cherowan, yeah. all those cats, man. They really looked after me and kept me out of a lot more trouble than I could have gotten. In. <laughs> and I don't know why my parents just believed that I was. Always, everything was just you know okay. Well, you know. You, you, I mean, you're a big boy. Ain't nobody gonna go really mess with you. So you know, you can defend yourself if there's trouble. <laughs> they tr- they but, uh, trusted them for f- whatever reason. I yeah, guess. I was coming home at three o'clock in the morning in high school. My mom did the same thing though. She was like, eh, whatever. I think she was over having over it after having five kids. She's like, ah, he'll right. be fine. Whatever. Exactly. I was the last. So right, me too. I was, we got but that. I was also the only boy. So. My my ah. sisters were always hot about it. How did Michael get to stay out too? <laughs> you know, my dad would just put one, just plug his ears or walk out the room. You know, yeah. I mean, they knew this was going to be my life, so they just mm, yeah supported you. Yeah, yes, they really right. did. Uh huh. From the early days of playing at church all the way through the yeah. contest, and now in walks this opportunity. Yes, and um, what's funny is that. Uh, um, what what was going on is that I was playing, by that time, Doug had moved over to, uh, no, it was not Doug Maynard. It was another gig at the Whiskey Junction that materialized on Wednesdays. And that was a group called the Men About Town. <laughs> and that was with John Della Selva. That lasted okay. for a little while. And then the combo decided they wanted to take Wednesdays at the fine line. So uh, I think it was Gordy and Gordy Knudsen and Bobby kind of flip flopped on that. Okay. And um, and Prince came down there, probably bored. Uh, you know, I mean, he would get bored and just take the limo downtown and go see what he could see. And um, the combo was playing. He recognized Margaret from uh, Margaret Cox from Tamara and the Scene when she worked with Jesse Johnson. Right. So he like you know gets her the, uh, he gets his bodyguard to go and ask her to come to his table they go to the limo and start talking and he's asking her you know well, what's going on with your career so on and so forth and um this is a really good band and she says oh yeah you should see you should see us with, with our regular drummer uh he's this kid from southeast minneapolis and uh, and she piques prince's interest so the next monday he's down at bunkers mm. you know and, uh, oh, oh okay you know, and um, did you know that, he was there? Uh, sorry, what's that? Did you know he was there in the room? Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, yes, because uh, uh, he—I think he came in the back way through the kitchen, but he took a seat like over on that side at bunkers where you got the uh, the booths. Oh yeah, and he just kind of snuck past the popcorn machine and into one of those booths, yep. and then security just kind of stood in front of the booth. You couldn't get to him. Um, and I went through the kitchen. I was going to do so, get some some of that fake juice out of that juice machine, <laughs> and I <laughs> I looked out there, and he was he was out there, and we kind of you know I saw him, he saw me, he just kind of waved, and I, I was, oh hey, and so I went over and talked to him for a few minutes, hmm. and uh, and then he got up to sit in on some slow blues, 
and um, and he was just kind of laser beaming like my hands, like he was just looking at my hands and kind of, you know. And I tried my best to be cool, you know. Right. Well, I know. I and just kind of, you got, you still got to play. I mean, yes, you, do. you know. So I just did what I knew, and he came back the following week, and that led to some invitations out to Paisley Park to, uh, you know, he'd have parties out there and whatnot, and. Uh, he actually invited me and Billy Franzi and Margaret Cox out to hear the Batman album before it got released. Like he had, he had finished it, and wow. uh, we came, went out there at like three o'clock in the morning and listened to the whole thing down. And right. yeah, so it just it it was kind of that was how I got sort of massaged in, and it finally there was an official call, and um, I, somehow I still hadn't grasped the the magnitude of the situation. Mm-hmm. I was I was at Augsburg, you know, trying to trying to do whatever I you know, I don't know what I was lying to myself mostly, yeah. saying that if you know if I was in college, uh, you know, looking at it as like a fallback, but you know, my heart wasn't in it. I've known I wanted to do music for a living since at least thirteen, fourteen. So I did it more to appease my father, who was an educator, and who you know was only giving me sound counsel, saying, you know, what if what if what if it don't happen? What right. if you don't make it? You know, you need something to fall back on. You know, and uh, so I, you know, I did the sensible thing and went to college. Um, and uh, I don't know what it was, Paul, to be honest, why I was so relaxed uh, with Prince. Like, I, he, he finally called and uh, asked if I wanted, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm calling to offer you a job. I want you to be in my band. And I, I asked him, I said, well, I'm in my... <laughs> I'm in my se- semester. Why exactly. Doing, yeah, okay. I was like, I'm like, do you think I'll have time to finish my fall semester? <laughs> and that's he just started cracking up. And he said, I think you're going to be probably too busy. Yeah. I said, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> then, then you got to break the news to dad. How'd dad take that? He was my dad. Was oh okay, all right. He took it in stride. I mean, my father was the type who I knew he was proud of me, but it was not like he was ever going to say that, you know, to my face. You know, really, like he. How I knew is how he bragged about me to all his friends. They got sick of hearing about me. You know, right. he was that type of dude. Was like, uh, I think it just uh, he tried to ingrain in me a work ethic. You know, and and. and to to rely less on however special I thought I was in the world, like you know, so I, I mean that's because that's how he kind of came up, like you know, nobody loves you but this family. <laughs> All right, and if you want it, you better go out there and get it because it's not just going to come to you, you know. And on top of that, growing up down south, because my family's from Bogalusa, Louisiana. Like Whoa. backwoods or way back. I did not know that, man. Yeah. They were wow. from Louisiana. And, um, you know, so there is also that idea that, you know, the black man's got to run twice as fast. Like you better, you know, like really, if you're looking for somebody to hand you an opportunity, it don't just, that doesn't happen. And we are going to get into that in a little bit. Cause yeah, I okay. think it's an important conversation. And I do want to touch on a couple of more Prince things. Just, sure. But I know you've done a lot of interviews on that, so we are going to cover a lot of things. What I want to know is, was it as much of a college experience being with Prince for you as it was for me? I mean, uh, we were two different eras, but for me, I, my mind was blown, and I didn't even know how much I learned in the little short amount of time I was there. You know what? I um, My mind was blown, but... I, I mean, I don't even know how I'm going to sound saying this. I really felt like I had some sort of understanding. Like, not intrinsic, but um, like he really could communicate his ideas well to me in a way that, mm-hmm. I, I, that I could digest. I mean, you know how he was. He wanted everything yesterday. Yeah. So you got to, I tell people all the time, they're like, what was it like working for a genius like Prince? And I tell them all the time without, you know, uh, you know, conceit or, or, or uh, uh, I don't know what it is, but it's like you, if anybody who's worked with a genius knows you have to almost be a genius. Yep. 
So you are Michael. Oh, come on, man. I'm just saying that. And, and you too. Anybody who could hang in that environment was of a special, you know, ilk. You were cut from a different cloth if you could hang with Prince. Well, here's something I want to point out to you, though. The difference between your tenure and my tenure, yours was more of a collaborative uh, uh, amount of time. Mine okay. was less. Mine was I was 17. He's going to tell me how it is. I'm going to sing and play how he wants. Mm -hmm. And then if if you do that, you're, you're great. But yours was from a musicality point of view. I don't know why we didn't have that. It's I don't care. I've still loved my period of time. It's just different. That's all. I get so, that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So looking back on that period of time, what do you think separates somebody like Prince from the rest of the great musicians that we know? What was that thing that because see I think of him as like an alien from another planet who was he was just he was a genius. He's brilliant. But I I wonder if you can put your finger on what you think it was that separated him from everybody else. I think he um I think that he was amongst a lot of other things uh I, I think he 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 doubted himself a lot less. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Like he didn't he always had the confidence that he was on the precipice of doing something great. He allowed himself to think that much of himself. Yeah. And I think often people like us, you know, we lean on humility, you know, because it's a it's a it's a social, you know, convention and it's, you know, it's tasteful and you don't really, you know, I mean, I'm sure, that, you know, it's any of us, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the guts to be that, that, that bold, <laughs> you know, well, well, I mean, well, it would be nice not to question yourself. Does this suck? Is this, is this okay that I play that well? Is he going to like it? Yeah. He really, the, those voices that are always, that can that can speak to you. Yes. He silenced he, them. He Exactly. And I think that probably was partly through self-analysis. What I've come to understand about myself is that uh, even as a songwriter or a producer or just, you know, if you're in the business of manifesting things from thin air, uh, it's not, it's not just you who's involved. It's, it's, you you don't know what you're channeling. You don't know what's coming through you sometimes. Mm, right. You know? And I'll say the very best drumming I ever did was almost like I was sleepwalking. You know? Yeah. Like it's not even a matter of the thought process. And I, I think that um uh me, I'm very analytical. But oh. <laughs> I, I, I analyze things over and over and, you know, try to, and whereas uh, until I got older, I didn't realize that intelligence is just as much a crutch, you know, as it is, a, as, as it can be a, a prison. It's, it's, mm. um, it's, I didn't mean to say that, that's just how it came out. But what I've learned is that the key is, is, to reach a level of awareness where you understand what's going on around you without the questions come through the, through your intelligence, through your need to analyze something. Right. But I think that Prince very much, I mean, I don't know if we ever cut anything more than twice. And that's mm -hmm. just because somebody messed up the arrangement, but he did not want to linger on a piece of music for too long. My he, brother Billy calls that hanging you out on a ledge. And you play better because... You, you can't have time to think and overanalyze. Right. And that's where the musicality and the brilliance is. And I, that, I didn't know that about Prince. My brother Billy is, he's like, nope, we're done. Yeah. yeah but I made a mistake there. No, that was that was supposed to be there. That's yeah, where Prince, the heart and the soul of these things are. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Prince was the same way. He didn't want to He didn't want to mess with it too long. Once we were there, just stay there. Stay there. Let's get it. Let's get it now. You know, mm. like he knew when the iron was hot, you know, and the, and he also knew when it just got overworked. Like, maybe we'll come back to that, you know, and he'd move on to something else. Like anytime the questions started to pop up, 
Like yeah. anytime he couldn't see, you know, when, when he felt like he couldn't surrender to the process, he'd just do something else. Right. right. And uh, I don't know if it's that way for any other artist, really. I've never had such in-depth uh, time with with any other artist, you know? Sure. I, I, who knew that much about music, who could do so much, you know? I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, will there ever be another <laughs> superstar musician of that level? You know what I mean? Who can, yeah. I mean, he's self, self-made. I mean, yeah, he sure was. his vision, his sound, his music, his way. His marketing, his clothing, yeah. his building, his everything. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know. Uh, that's what I learned. I was, I was, That's what freaked me out. I'm like, 10 years later, after I left the fold, I went, I learned this in a two-year period from him without mm-hmm. him ever really telling me this. I just watched him during his golden years, what I would call his golden <laughs> years, where everything he would do was just brilliant and... It, you yeah. can't help but learn if you've got your eyes open a little bit. Exactly. You can see it all. I mean, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, expose to you how he did it. but No. No. Such a – he just – I'm telling you, it, the key is to trust. The key is to trust. Like, he just trusted himself. Mm. And, and things – Came to their fruition. He I don't manifested know. a lot of stuff, including yeah. a, 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 a movie, three movies for that matter. Yeah. Anyway, so he w- go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead, man. I was gonna say, um, <laughs> were you in the Prince camp when Ricky was uh, the my brother Ricky was the staff producer out there? Were you in the camp then? Yeah. Because I would sneak back in. And being Prince and I weren't necessarily getting along at that point in time when when you were in the camp, but I was still there, hanging with my brother because Ricky and I did a lot of productions together. And you and I, during that period, were in the studio together uh-huh. more than I've ever been with any other drummer in my life. Really? Okay. Yes. You and I did a lot of records in that short amount of time, and I would yeah. have to say. That George Benson record that you and I did together will go down in history as my favorite record because if you recall, here's what I recall. We, again, probably only went through the songs once or twice, fixed little, ate well with Tommy (laughs) LaPoole. And we were playing with... He was my idol. I don't know if he was yours, but I, I, I've George been Benson. listening to George Benson since since uh, the Breezin record. So right, yeah. And then and then Billy Franzi went, "Oh man, you need Beyond the Blue Horizon. You need." And then I was he like, named oh, all the Bebop man. records, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Um. Yes. Uh, uh. Yeah. We we made a way like like uh like possums eating grapes. Like two possums. <laughs> Man, was that good? Turf that and was, turf. The, I yeah. think the best money I've ever been paid on any any album session. Oh yeah, the hang was incredible. It's Tommy Lapuma and George, who together sold like twenty five million records. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the real. That, yeah, I think I I've never felt as much a part of like royal music history as during that. I'm glad time. I'm not the only one because that that no. period. That record for me, in the hang with you, and the way you and I developed a style of playing with each other, yeah. the communication that we had mm-hmm. musically was, yes. uh, was so solid and so musical. Yeah. And I just always look forward to getting to play music with you again because we pick off where we left off however long it has been since we played together. And that's, sure. You don't find that every day. Right, we're just telling each other what we've been up to when we right. play it. We get yeah. to do that, yeah. Yeah, and it's and the only other person I really have that with is Sonny. Sonny and I, it's like it's like falling off a log. It's like, well, how you been, man? And like it's literally a musical conversation, you know. Sonny is something else, man. Oh. He is. Uh, I call him the funky originator. I I called him out in uh, yeah. uh in one of my songs because he deserves the credit that he gets. Sonny's everything, man. Yeah, I mean, I heard about Sonny 
Uh, David Island was the one who told me about Sonny. Oh, man. Somebody right? said something about Sonny. I said, who's Sonny Thompson? Sonny Thompson. Oh, man. Uh, I, 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 he was the, the, the you know, David. Uh, the, definitely, definitely <laughs> the baddest musician who, who ever came from the North Side. I mean, it, it, Sonny was better than a lot of us are as adults <laughs> when we yeah. were kids. Right. Yeah. So Sonny, Sonny's a different, different. Uh, uh, what would you say? I, he is. He's brilliant. He's a genius. That he's, guy can. He, he's. Whenever you have that much talent like that, yeah. You know, it's, you have to have a personality like a Sonny Thompson. I mean, you exactly. Just do. Exactly. That didn't really say describe him that well, but that's okay. And just you know, I mean, but it's like, I mean, almost every musician I know is eccentric in some way, shape, or form. Right. You know? And you almost have to be. Yeah. To what degree? I don't know if that has any play, any uh, say on you know your capacity or your your ability. But I mean, it's like Prince was not on well. He was a different cat. <laughs> you know. Yes. Like yes. he would. Say things that were I could only guess were riddles <laughs> from yeah. time to time. Like and there's something about living in the ether like that, and just living in a place of creation. I think mm -hmm. that you got to be kind of half crazy. You got to be half crazy to, to 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 work in this business anyway. <laughs> yeah. From a pragmatic, and, and, you know, and so survive and keep. Going back for more and more and more. Oh, and man, more. yeah. it's you got to be a glutton for punishment. People would say to me all the time, like, well, how come you don't have more have students? Why don't you? I'm like, I don't recommend this life for anybody. <laughs> my children, my daughter is out in L.A. trying oh, to do God the thing. And you. all I do is I, I do what my mom did to me, is, which is support, support, support. Uh-huh. It's yeah. a tough life, man. It's, a, it's, it's not easy, man. I mean... You know, uh, it just last year, this time, February 11th, I think was the first date on my tour at Soul Asylum in 2020. And, you know, that's, touring don't change. Mm. You're still, you're living on a steel tube with a bunch of dudes. <laughs> you know, you're staying up late, you're waking up early, you're burning yeah. the candle at both ends, your people are fighting, you know, and, uh, you know, it's it don't change. It's rough, man. Yeah, you know you get off get off stage, you get on a bus, and you drive for nine hours. You know, it's right. the, you got to really. Uh, uh, somebody, uh, what did somebody tell me? How do I encourage my son? And I said, I wouldn't. Don't encourage your your kids into this life because this life uh, it's it's tough. You can't. It ain't for everybody. I mean. It's just not, man. You don't. Not not everyone has the intestinal fortitude to push through. Right. It just and the monotony of just twenty two hours out of the day, you're trying to figure out what to do with your brain. So let's talk about that a little bit now. We're not going to get into any more print stuff because that's been well documented. Sure. I want to talk about what this podcast is called: Music on the Run. We talk about and give advice, not only musical advice, and talk about our our lives, but we also talk about how you survive on the road. And you were talking just then about what it is like to be on the road. You know, you don't necessarily think of Soul Asylum as being, you know, the picture of health uh, <laughs> on the road. You know, they are, uh, I would, I would assume that they lead a full on rock and roll lifestyle. Now it's rock and roll. I mean, sad. how do you, Michael Bland, stay healthy on the road? Oh boy. Do you stay healthy on the road, young man? Healthier on the road than anywhere else. How is that? Because I'm on a schedule. I know how much time I need. I I, I need to do things. Okay. Uh, it, like on tour, my life has a structure that I've never been able to maintain in my personal life. Hmm. Um. So it's good for me because um. Uh. I don't. I, I I mean I might have a you know I'll hang out for a little while I'll I'll, I'll maybe I'll have a cocktail even you know and uh, then it's you know I, I I've tried <laughs> calling my wife in those late hours but she don't pick up the phone Funny. So, and that's all right you know um, but uh, I'll call I'll leave a message or I'll text her or something uh, watch a lot of television 
<laughs> it's not right. It's a lot of movies. You know, I, and now that I have a, a ProLogic 10 on my on my computer, I could actually get into doing music if, if I ever get to get on the road again. Right. But, um, you know, so there is that also um, that I just never really, I, I don't know why I took so long to do it. But um, uh, on your podcast, you said that um, it took you 51 years to figure out that putting the wrong things into your body is going along with the program and, and, and uh, killing yourself. You oh, sure. change the way you were eating uh, when you turned 51? Or what, what happened? Did you have no, a... Uh, I, I, <laughs> you mean what literally happened to, to, to make me become a vegan? Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, you know, me and, and meat, we're very fond of one another. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I want to be clear that this is not like a whole thing leading into like, well, meat is murder and right. we need to protect and the animals are, are our spiritual equals on this planet. None of that. Right. I, if you put a steak in front of me right now, uh, it would be the hardest thing in my life not to just. Yep. It's so it's not that, but uh, I guess I can, I, one day I was eating a, uh, uh, chicken parmesan sandwich from Devani's. And a voice in my head said, how do you expect to live well if you're only eating dead things? Wow. Really? Yeah. And I, blah, 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 I just went on. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> That's just some, that. I don't know yeah. who said that. Uh, uh. Yeah. And, uh, one day, I, I mean, I guess I must have told it to my wife because she remembered that. Hmm. And also at the same time, my uh, <laughs> my stepdaughter, Nico, she was struggling with wanting to become a vegetarian or, or, or vegan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we weren't making it any easier bringing Popeyes in the house. Right. And, you know, like who's going to resist Popeyes? Right. So, you know, we kind of, you know, uh, worked it out as a family. Huh. And decided that's what we were going to do. Do you think, feel better? Uh, is there a noticeable change, or is there? I, I people ask me that all the time. Hmm. I mean, other than uh, you know dropping a few pounds, and yep. um, and uh, you know, uh, not being you know so winded. Those yeah. are the main ways. I don't really notice a dietary, like, I don't know if my, if my, you know, if my intestines are functioning better or if I, you know, like, I don't know what kind of other benefits may be happening. But I mean, I mean, I've known long enough that, you know, the carcinogens in red meat are directly, you know, related to cancer. So, I mean... There's just, I think I, what it took was getting more education about right. the subject. And well, what you I spoke about that, complacency in so many things on one of the podcasts that I listened to. And yeah, it's hard. It's hard to change. It's hard to change, especially when you like yourself. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't like themselves, uh, Paul. Yeah. I, I like myself. I think I, I turned out all right. <laughs> you know? Well, so. I have to agree with you, Michael Blaine. <laughs> I do, well, I do. But uh, uh, the thing is, is that I think when I was younger, I thought that life would be very short. Hmm. And I, I'm, here I am, like 52, yep. <laughs> you know. Thank I'll be you, 53 Lord. in March. Life is long, man. Life yep. is long. And if I'm going to be here, uh, I, have a, I feel a responsibility to, to live well. Huh. Um, because I, so many people... You know, who don't wake up to the idea, you know, live to be in their 80s and they can't function. Right. You know, and it's like if, I, if, if I'm going to be here, I have to function. I've got to be able to function. I've got to be able to just, you know, and it's it's not easy. Every day it's a fight. You know, yeah. you know the Wendy's commercial comes on, I got to change the channel. 
dude, it's like me with a with <laughs> well the alcohol. It, it's a con it's yeah. Like, it's okay. like come on. Yeah, but I'm always up for the fight, and I like myself better without sure, that. Sure, that's just a personal choice. I got you, and I don't know that I feel emotionally different about any of it. Uh, you know, I, you I just feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to, and I think also that um, when I told my wife about that voice in my head, mm. um, she said something that led me to another voice that said. You have to rise to the level of your consciousness. Mm. Otherwise, it'll be your undoing. If you understand certain things and you don't apply them in your life, it's a recipe for destruction. It, it's That's how it came to me. Like, you can't become you know, sentient. Uh, you can't know more and do less. Right. That'll be what you're it undoing, is. like you said. Yes. You, If you know, it's just like saying, if you know better, you're supposed to do better. It's the same thing. Like, once you're awake, you can't just go back to sleep. Right. You, you have to yes. take the actionable steps and keep up with your consciousness. If your body does not follow the level of your consciousness, Things are out of alignment. Things are out of balance. And you bring up such a great point that I'm. it's a perfect segue into what happened here in Minneapolis last summer, and that is the killing of George Floyd. And you, my friend, were one of the first people I called on the phone because I think there was a lot of people like me, white folks, who didn't know quite how to help or how to... Uh, react and they didn't know what to do i didn't know what to do so i called you man because i've known you for so long i knew you would give it to me straight um you have been a, a, a very outspoken about what's been going on and i think one of the things that you told me at that time is in something you just mentioned there was you can't be sleeping when there's information out there you gotta dig for it if it's worth knowing i mean there's 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 an education that I got in my school system that is probably dramatically different than what really is happening there. And that is just so wrong on so many levels. I don't, I don't even comprehend how that's possible, uh, but it's happening. So how do we, um, how, how can we become more, uh, how can we be a, 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 a focus for change and, and be a voice and, and and help what's going on in this in this terrible terrible age that we're still living in? <laughs> well, I'll, go ahead, I'll, preach, I'll, preach, I'll, MB. right? Exactly. Well, thank you. I'm glad you asked that the, question because I have the I don't. <laughs> I know you don't, and but you have knowledge, man, and that's. Knowledge is power. Well, here's the thing, though, is that, um, I mean, pretty much we understand that racism exists everywhere in our culture, in our society, and especially in the unexamined, unchecked normal, what people consider to be normal. I mean, it's relative to, to each and every one of us. What's normal? You know, so it's a lot harder to see if you're not looking for it. Right. You know, and that's the that's the magic trick. That's the thing is that if it, it's it's how do you know you it, I mean, you don't know you're living in the matrix until somebody tells you. True. You know, and uh, I'm a lot more interested in sharing information and uh, and fielding questions from, you know, all sorts of people that. A lot of my black colleagues are not like they really feel like it, it's the the problem is <laughs> the 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 problem is all around and if you want to see it you can see it like uh, uh, like they don't feel any <laughs> for lack of a better term any obligation to educate white folks sure about you know uh, well, a, a, I'm sure they're they're they've had it. 
Well, yeah, it's yeah. it's easy to get fed up. If you're black in America, it's easy to yeah. get fed up. Yeah. I, but I, I, mean, I get it. You know, you, you and I, being in the business we're in, I mean, I, I've been fortunate because uh, th- th- more than in any other, well, maybe except for like maybe in the area of sports or entertainment, uh, I guess in sports and entertainment, these are the only places where your ability matters more than the color of your skin, you know. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, in a way, it was my good fortune, but it didn't, to, to be in music and to be judged by, more by what I can do than, you know, what, co- what color I happen to be. Right. More often than not. I yeah. Like, you know, there's still people at Soul Asylum gigs who didn't know the band. When, when Winston and I are, are playing with Soul Asylum, Winston Roy from New York, Black Eye also. Yeah, uh, you know, and we would be cracking up on the tour bus, and how many of these people, like in the front row, we get out east, and you know, some of them wouldn't even—they didn't even want to acknowledge us. Look at us, like they just be doing looking at Dave, rock, man. And just be looking at Dave, wow. and just and me and Winston would be cracking up, and it would break. I told Dave about that; it, it broke his heart. You know, it sure did. Well, I mean, other than just being like, uh, just. Uh, overwrought with white guilt and being a Catholic, he's really, <laughs> yeah, he's I really understand these things. sensitive to that sort of thing. He's v- sure. very uh, uh, empathetic uh, to those who are suffering, which is what makes part of what makes him a great songwriter. I think sure is that he's, he's compassionate. He can see things from a lot of sides, you know, and he just, you know, he knows what it's like to be an underdog. You know, I mean, twelve years on, on in, in a you know in a in a van, you know, <laughs> trying trying to what's like? What are you doing with your life? You know, nobody knows what they're doing with their life when they get into music. They're just following, you know, heart their heart. Between yes, passion. yeah, of course. And Doesn't luckily, it, it all worked out for him eventually. You know, yeah. but um, you know, uh, some of us find that. I mean, I, I think that, well, without speaking for him too much, I think that the the pageantry that goes along with it is really not his style. He doesn't really care for all that. I mean, to me, uh, you know, in ways, he's more of an heir to the Dylan throne <laughs> than, his, than Dylan's own kid. I mean, wow, Perner has got such, he's such a, such a strong writer. He's a, he's a great American writer. Mm. Uh, in my opinion, right. um, and of his, it, of his his peer group, I think the best easily. You know, and a lot of people disagree. They'd say either Kurt Cobain or yeah. you know, like somebody else. You know, along those lines. But all of those dudes stole from Perner, and and they've admitted it. Wow. You know? So, uh, anyway, I'm not sure what I'm saying about this this exactly, but um, uh. It, it's I ha, he always has questions. He's always asking about like things that are considered to be black culture, right. or why is this and why is that, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, so I guess it's no skin off my nose to at least speak from what I I know, mm. you know, and um, I, I don't I, I don't know, man. It's uh, I was really startled. When I heard that, like, 70 million people, you know, like, this last election, like, all of those things, took, and I don't want to make it a, a partisan thing. I'm just speaking right. from my own. I was surprised that so many people decided that 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 Donald Trump should be the president for another four years. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people got they got their reasons. If I was a rich person, I probably would vote for the person who's, you know, who's going to act in my better interests. Like, I understand it on a pragmatic level. Right. But I don't, it's, if you're talking about um, not just, not ethics, really, because I don't, I think polit- politics is generally, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> Non-ethical anyway. Yeah, it's not. Right. It's not. It's not really about ethics. But you're talking about a soulful level, a a a, a life. Uh, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. I mean, that's just, I mean, but that's an example of how differently t- two types of people can see the world that we're living in. Right. Or the or what you know or where things have gone or you know it's um I told somebody the other day I think I posted I said if I could just get uh, one cable news station that just reported the facts just give me the facts I I am so sick of op-ed and opinion-based news that I could yeah. scream I just want just tell me what happened I'll make up my own mind yeah. about how I feel about it um and I think, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't expecting to go here, but I think the media is to blame for a lot of this. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I do. I mean, do you it, think it, at this point we have an opportunity to to heal? Are we at a healing point yet, or are we still? Well, that seventy million is telling me. Well, okay. Maybe right. we're not. I mean, right. I don't. I don't want to be a downer, and I really didn't even want to dive too deeply into this, but. Only because I had my show, Music Politics, with, with my friend Dan Spiffy Newman. Yeah. And it's kind of indefinitely on hiatus. Why and is that, I, by the way? Well, partly because I don't think that, um, I think that I, I got exhausted. I began to uh, really, um, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, I didn't. I, I didn't loathe the experience. I thought we shared a lot of important information. Mm-hmm. And we showcased a lot of black people in places where people are not used to seeing them. We had judges on. We had scientists. We had, I mean, and, and mostly they were black women. And I think most people in society don't realize that black women are now the highest educated people in this country. Like, as far as numbers to, you know, like they they're, they're they, they, the black women are the most educated segment of the population in the United States. And, um, but they, you don't hear about it that often. I mean, I guess you, you, <laughs> you got a vice president, who, you know, now. Right. That, so you hear more about it than you did before. Right. But um, uh, it's, long story short, it, it really, not being involved in a forum that, that, lent itself to be solution oriented hmm. got it I, like I'm I, I need to be solvent in my life I need to focus on things that I that I can control and and, and do the best I can with those things right. and civil unrest is not that ain't my wheelhouse not really I was really upset about a lot of things and I'm not uh, I'm not a social I'm not a crusader. I'm not really not, you know? And I think that ultimately I I had to face the fact that this is not just about an election. It's not just about, you know, uh, people who fear change. It's a, it's, it's a social condition and um, it has a lot of support. I don't want to say that I felt powerless but I know that whatever it is, it's going to take some time and it's going to take a, a type of concentration that people don't have uh, the depth for any longer. Or they don't seem to. They could. But, I mean, it, it's, it, it, it just got to be a very dark conversation once a week for two hours. Mm. And I think it was yeah. more That's than... hard, man. That's hard. I mean, yeah, it is. It, other than the well, and it's got to be frustrating too when when you see the lack of education out there, and you're the one who's having to educate. Which well, was not, positive about that. Not only that, it's like every week somebody Facebook was on us. Somebody, certain people just didn't like what we were doing, and I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, I mean, I can't name names because I don't know who it was, but you know how it is, or maybe you don't. Do you know what it's like to get blocked on Facebook for saying something? That's not, just the no, truth? Not really. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but it's a it's a very interesting dynamic. And, um, you know, it's a, it, it's, it, it's a, it, it's, it's complicated, but it's simple. E- either you care about other people or you don't. Right. 
you know, and well, personally, I the, the research that I've been doing, I, I think that you shared some really crucial information in classic Michael Bland compassionate style. You you have your opinions. There's no question about that. But the it, from the way I know you, um. I I saw nothing but a positive in there, and I can understand that how it could have been draining. But uh, somebody's, you know, somebody's got to step up, and you did during that time period. And I hope uh, that that uh, either someone that that has the same reach you do does the same again, because it's it, this can't be pushed under the rug. This just can't go away, because all it's going to do is is uh, inflame again. And that's from my opinion, I think what you were doing was, was a, a real positive. So well, anyway, there you go. There's I appreciate that. And I'd like to believe that. It, yeah, it was, but it, the effort that it took to spin it, the effort that it took to find that silver lining when you're surrounded by nothing but Ooh. clouds, you know, it's yeah. like the, the, it kept being further to reach. And then yeah. you start hearing about how like, okay, well, okay. Um, you know, more black men, and women die. You know, time passes, and these things keep happening. And then it starts to look like, okay, well, maybe Derek Chauvin might get off. Like, it's hard to maintain. It's hard to keep the, my, my, one of the, maybe the greatest guitar player who ever walked the earth, Jeffrey Lee Johnson, mm. had, uh, wrote a song called It's Hard to Keep the Faith in Times Like These. Yeah. And, um, he came from even a different generation than I. Like, he was uh, significantly older than, than me. Um, and uh, God rest his soul. And, uh, but, so, like, I was born in 69. Like, Jeff was old enough to see, like, good old, like, <laughs> frontier-level racism <laughs> in this country. <laughs> also growing up in Philly, yeah. you know. Um so a lot of his songs, they're funky as all get out, but there's mm. always, there's a darkness, there's a sadness. And I, you know, I get, I got more of, about where he was coming from through his songs than talking to him because he was a man of few words and um, he generally tried to stay in, 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 in a positive place. He tried. He's maybe the most professional musician I ever worked with in my life. Wow. Um, but said very little. It's funny because um, Sonny and I did a trio gig with, with Jesse Johnson at um, at First Avenue. It was like for a Hendrix thing, like a Hendrix tribute. And um, we were in rehearsal with Jesse, and Jesse was talking about how, <laughs> like, man, this dude came up from Philly to show me the book. Uh, uh, Jeff Lee was playing with Esperanza Spaulding. Oh, okay. And couldn't do the gig with D'Angelo. So Jesse came on, and they asked Jeff to, you know, take the train up from Philly to come to SIR or wherever they were at to kind of run the book so Jesse could see what was going on. And I guess Jesse was just like, why don't you just take this dude? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. right. wow. <laughs> like, this cat's killing me. What are this? <laughs> wow. I don't know exactly what he said, but, it, you know, it's uh, – and Jesse, if I've, never, if I've ever seen somebody a more – like just natural. Jesse's a natural man. He sure is guitar player. Jesse Johnson. He's speaking of the uh, Jesse yes. Johnson, who was a guitar player in the time. Man, or he, he wore, uh, man. Was. Me and Sonny, we were wore out. Yeah, rehearsing with Jesse, just because you just everything he played was that day. He got that attitude, man. He oh, he, that he has. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I I actually uh, almost was his roommate back in 1983. Whoa! He and I almost moved in with each other, even though he was the one who was cracking the whip, uh, you know, yeah. during the time uh, rehearsals. We fought like like brothers, and then we loved each other like brothers. Okay. So he's like, we should just get a place together. I was living with my mom. That's, <laughs> that's how young I was. Yeah. Oh, man. I got you. That's, man, that's funny. I, yeah, I can see uh, that that dealing with Jesse, uh, you know, on a, on a regular basis in closed quarters might be 
It, it might was be, interesting. I bet was, it was interesting. I mean, I, man, I, 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 I mean, learned so first. much, though. I did. I, I, I got to give it to him. And I told yeah. him. I've, I've been able to do that with a lot of people I've been in bands with. I've been able to go back while they're alive and say, man, thank you for showing me this, that, and the other thing. And that is for that for me is uh, so important to be able to go back and thank the people who brought you along, you know? Oh, sure. Absolutely. You know? Um, I, uh, I just, re- I was going to say earlier, I remember Prince, uh, saying, I-, I think it was one day he might've seen you like creeping through the atrium or something. And, uh, somehow your name came up. He's, and, and I mean, you, oh boy. Uh, no, no, no. I, th- I believe he said, I think he said, uh, I think what he literally said was that you were the baddest white boy he ever worked with. No way. Really? Well, that's yeah. news to me. He said. I never heard that. Paul. Paul's baddest white boy I ever worked with. <laughs> you know, it was fun for me to be able to get back in his good graces towards the end of his life. We, sure. we ended up laughing and, 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 you know, he was the same guy, just a little bit more seasoned. Sure. You know, 25 Absolutely. years after the, the fact, but. I still, yeah. I'm sorry, we're back on him, but that's a it's it's yeah, a well, weird commonality between us that we've never did. really even discussed. Well, that's true. That is very true because we have so much other territory that's also adjoining. But uh, maybe it's because we it was a different it was the differential in the time period. Yeah, but you know what? That will always um, that will always bind us and anybody else who's been in that camp because there's an understanding. Uh huh of people who were in that camp of what it was. You can't really explain it. But if you were there, you kind of can see the look in the other person's eye and go, oh, okay, yeah. I get it. You know. All right. We were we were in the same war, but you were in a different country. Different, different company. <laughs> country, maybe. Maybe yeah. country, maybe company. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh it was it was a great experience in my life and I'm sure it was yours too, man. It was incredible. You know, yeah. but I mean, uh, what it it, it 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 made a lot of other gigs hard to do after. I'm sure it I mean, did. I, you know, and I, mm-hmm. sometimes I couldn't hide. I couldn't hide my uh, uh, displeasure. Yes, from no. from the people around me who knew me. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I was on a gig, and I'm not going to say who I was working for because it may come again, and I don't. <laughs> I got you. Well, a lot of gig, and it was kind of just like a straight up R and B gig, you know. Um, and uh, and uh, I'll just refer to these people. In, in the, in, I mean, uh, my friend Icky James was on. He was he was actually was a guitar tech. Magoo, who had tech oh, for me yeah. at Paisley, was my drum tech. Uh, uh, Scotty Baldwin was the uh, front of house. No kidding. And inside of the same day of rehearsal. All three of those dudes ca- came to me and said, "You bored already?" And I was like, <laughs> they knew because they what were in the same camp. They oh, said yeah. nothing. It's just like you know, you just it, you it ain't you know. We know how you how you are when you all the way in it. Mm-hmm. And I just you know, they nobody else, none of the L.A. cats knew. They didn't know me. They didn't care. Of course, right? You know, I was just tr- trying to do what was necessary. And if yeah. playing at ninety eight beats per minute almost all night, you know, is what's necessary, then that's what you do. I'm trying to make a living, Paul. Right, I wasn't trying to. Again. I understand yeah. you. I'm not trying Trust to get me. my jollies. I'm trying to work. I understand you. So <laughs> you know, I'm like, don't tell no, don't get, don't, yeah. not go talk about this again. Right. I need this job as bad as any of y'all do. Of course. So let's just act like I'm on full tilt. Yeah. And let's get this money. <laughs> After all, it is the music business. Yes, it's the music business, it and really it's funny because I, I, I need to call. I've, twice this guy has told me Dennis Chambers said he wants you to call him and I think that somewhere on the inside I just every time I, I've only been on the phone with Dennis twice and he just he, uh, he frightens me a little bit really? yeah <laughs> really? and I don't I don't um, it's a, a reverential fear I got you you know what I mean it's like mm-hmm. I don't know where Will Lee ranks in your book, but say you just talking to Will, like, do you feel a little? You oh, know, yeah, I've I've looked up to him my entire life. That's what, so exactly. Funny we're doing a we're doing a project with Will right now. I'm like, wow, really? 
Thank yeah. You. <laughs> you know, it's, I, yeah mean, I understand that. He paid me the greatest compliment. Uh, one of the greatest compliments ever, man. I was uh, uh, doing the Groove All-Stars with Yamaha like years ago, like 2001. Yeah. And uh, I always wanted to pick like the rock and roll cuts because most of the other cats were either doing like, you know, James Brown or, yeah. you know, some ballads or like some like hard rock. You know, uh, like Tommy Aldridge was playing like, uh, man, I don't remember what it was. It was, uh, I think, Crying in the Rain. Like, he, they used to play with White Snake. Oh, wow. And, and pretty much everybody was scared of that dude that day because he was just so, man, Tommy Aldridge was so bad with it, man. Chris Daves and his, and, his, and his little crew, Tommy played some riff, and they all just stood up at the table and just went. <laughs> They, they, yeah, they, they, he said he hit something that was just, it just, you know, when the whole room is just like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah it was one of those, and his boys went scattering, but he was just standing at the table. Oh, that's so good. I was like, okay, that's that must so be good. a compliment in the highest order. But right. um, I didn't. Uh, I think Neil Steubenhouse was the bass player in the MD on the gig. Okay, he's great. I, too. I get up to get set up, and I see Will walk out <laughs> and say, "I got this, man." <laughs> and Neil said, "All right," and unplugged, and Neil plugged in, uh, or uh, Will, Will plugged, plugged in, in, and uh, we played custard pie together. Zeppelin, that's on. Uh, oh yeah, uh, physical graffiti. And I'm like, "What? What happened?" Well, like I, he did one at rehearsal. He, you know, I didn't even know he was going to be there. He just walked out, and plugged in. Okay, man, let's that's, do it. That's like, him, man. Whoa, it's, it's Will Lee. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> you guys would be two peas in a pod, man. You both love life. You both love music. It's all about that hang. And yeah, he, uh, he didn't miss a stroke, man. Of course he, he did. Just, I'm, I'm like, oh, all right. That was a, that was a. Th those meetings were always uh, those little groove all stars. I don't. I never really enjoyed the Nam show because yeah, it's just a lot of commotion. You don't really get to talk to anybody, yeah. and you know, and it sounds like a big guitar center the whole time. <laughs> so I never got to speak to any of those cats until we were at the at the Yamaha events, and um, that same year I got to I, I sat with Andy Newmark for probably three four hours. No kidding! And he just told me sly stories, and I told him print stories, and we talked about just like time and playing to alternate sources of time, and you know because he did a lot of work. I mean, the, the Fresh by Sly and the Family Stone. He's playing to a rhythm ace the whole time. Wow. You never hear one flam. You don't ever hear him off at all. I'm just like, where do you get such a stream of consciousness? Discipline, man. It's discipline, but it's also, it's, I can't even really put it into words because to play that accurate is a combination of it's also trust you have to you know it's but it's also feel and it's also like <laughs> measuring the time in very little increments yeah you know and uh and he and i we just talked about it like for for quite a while mm. um and uh then he got up and played if you want me to stay and everybody went quiet I bet. and man he oh, the, the sound check was more vicious than the gig usually are right uh, yeah, uh, there's, you know, there's no holes barred in the sound check. You're right, and usually, yeah, it's like if sound too good at sound gig check. Time, let's tense up yeah, a little bit now. Yeah, exactly. I was, um, <laughs> I, I actually became conscious of that one time. Um, me and Johannes Tona, yeah, great uh, place here, did a, bass player here in town. Yeah, did a trio gig with Jeff Lee at at Ice House, and Johannes had been touring with Jeff over in Europe with a different drummer. So I had to get caught up on some of the material they were they were playing now. And so I listened to the recordings and, uh, okay, all right. And we started playing something. And we barely got through the head, got into, like, the solo section. And Jeff just, wait, stop. No, wait. <laughs> Don't waste it here. Don't it. waste it here. Got it. Yep. Uh, okay, I get it now. Like, he heard what he needed to hear to, to say, don't. Don't waste those notes. That's so funny because I've worked with people who sound check for hours. So have I. <laughs> and I'm burnt by the time the gig comes. Yeah. Burnt. Uh-huh. I'm like, and then I start questioning, why can't I play this better? 
Because you've played it 17 times already before the gig. Hey. But, but you, anyway. You, you know you're talking, you preaching to the converted. Yeah. I mean, Prince, two hours, two and a half oh. hours. Sound check, two and a half hour show, and then go on, go jam somewhere for another three hours at night. Oof. You know, I mean, fortunately, he had, you know, a wellspring of material, so we didn't always have to play the same thing. True. You know, yeah. and him, he would, he would like, change the set on the way out to the stage. Is that right? He, you know, he said, take me with you, out. We're doing Raspberry Beret instead. And that might have been five shows ago that you played Raspberry Beret last time. So I'm walking up the stairs to the drums like, how did that arrangement go? <laughs> You'll find out when you're done. Meanwhile, g- dude, get focused. You're in the, the thunder. is coming up. You got to play. Oh, ah, yeah. You got a show, a whole other show, mm-hmm. you know. Like he would just, I don't know if he did that just to see who could hang. Or, sure he did. Uh, I, I, I think like, he you know what? did a lot of that stuff to keep you on your toes. Uh-huh. I think he did. You know what, man? I have enjoyed this hang and this talk you know you you michael bland i don't see you very often man but yeah i hope you know how i feel about you and uh you're just one of my favorite people and of course one of my favorite musicians too and i just appreciate you coming on the show and hanging out with me and then sharing some knowledge i i don't know how much of that i i I did but it was great to see you and speak to you too and i don't think we actually got into what we were probably expecting to but um that's that's Jazz, man. That's jazz. <laughs> jazz. It's jazz, man. All oh, right. I just re- I, it was so much fun, man, to see you. And I know that uh, the people who listen to this podcast will absolutely love the content. And they'll they'll know why I feel about you and the way the Peterson family feels about you for your entire life, man. Yeah, so I've you've always, always got family here. I've, I've always uh, felt supported. And um, and uh, it's it's... I mean, from from the day that I met your family, from the day that I met Patty, everybody else just gave me the same love Patty did, you know. And I, I can't thank you uh, enough. We've done some great things together, Paul. We've we have. we've had many musical adventures that a lot of we people have. could only dream of. Mavis Staples, oh, George man. Benson. Woo. We did it. We did the darn thing. We did it, and we well, ain't done yet, man. Okay, no, we're done. Yeah, let's just get past this. Uh, get the Rona. Let's get past the Rona. I will drink to that. And ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) my buddy, Mr. Michael Bland. That's it for this this episode 32 of Music on the Run. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Music on the Run was hosted by yours truly, St. Paul Peterson. Edited and produced by my buddy, Davide Razzo. Video editing by Ivan Sebastianov. And a very special thanks to the people who financially support this podcast. And remember, people are counting on you. Go be inspiring today. Yeah.